This is Michael Altos, Clinical Pharmacology of Inhalational Anesthetics, Part 1. We're going to start with the discussion of MAC. MAC is a concept that's been introduced to you almost from your first day of anesthesia training, and we should clarify exactly what this is. MAC, everyone says, is the minimum alveolar concentration. Really, it's a misnomer because it's a median. The MAC is the concentration of anesthetic agent that prevents movement in 50% of patients in response to a certain stimulus. So in a rat, it's a tail clamp. In a human, it's an uh, incision. And the first thing we need to think about is whether MAC is even clinically meaningful. I mean, how often is it that you take a patient and give them only inhalational agent and nothing else? No fentanyl, no Versed, no paralytics and then see if they move. And for that matter, when the patient does move, you just shrug your shoulders and tell the surgeon, what can I do? You know, 50% of patients are going to move when I give them a MAC of anesthetic. It's hard to see how this is actually a clinically useful piece of information. And for that matter, I have ways of keeping people from moving 100% of the time because I can give them rocuronium. So then why do I even need the concept of MAC at all? And the answer is that MAC was first invented for the purpose of comparing different agents. So we know that a certain concentration of sevoflurane is equal to some other certain concentration of isoflurane, and so on, and we can compare them by finding out what their MAC value is. So that's the first use of MAC. The other use, and this is really, I think, where we have more clinical use because we don't do a lot of research where we need to specify exactly how much agent patients have, but there are other MACs and they are described as a fraction of the usual MAC, the MAC of movement. So there's MAC awake. At what point do patients open their eyes when you call their name? And it's usually at about 0.1 MAC. MAC blocking the alveol blocking the autonomic response, right? when patient's heart rate and blood pressure don't change. Well, you need a lot more than a MAC for that. You probably need 1.7 to 2 MAC. And again, that's just for 50% of the patients. And then MAC recall, which is probably what we care about the most. We care about our patients remembering what's going on. And that's usually somewhere around 0.3 to 0.5 MAC. And that's why I usually get a little un uncomfortable in the operating room when I see that someone's running an anesthetic at less than half a MAC because I think we're starting to get into the range of awareness which is one of the worst things that can happen to a patient um, aside from an actual physical injury. MACs are additive so if you give a half a MAC of nitrous oxide and half a MAC of sevoflurane they are approximately going to add up to one full MAC of anesthesia. There are factors that will increase and decrease MAC. So MAC is increased by patients at young age, patients who chronically use alcohol, and then there are some questionable factors. There are some who think that patients with a lot of anxiety will have an increased MAC, patients whose sympathetic system is increased due to cocaine or ephedrine or amphetamines, and perhaps patients in a hypermetabolic state, like with thyroid disease or a high fever. All of these increase MAC. Actually, one thing I'm, I have not put on this chart, but I probably should, is red hair has actually been shown to be a uh, definitely demonstrated factor that increases patients' MAC. It increases their requirement for anesthesia. We also know many factors that decrease MAC. Administration of other medications like uh, fentanyl, Versed, other medications. Older age is reliably going to decrease MAC by 6% per decade after age 40. And we've shown that on the chart over here. That if the MAC of sevoflurane is, let's say it's, um, well, it's, it's about 2%. And then that's at age 40. So let's say a 90-year-old is going to have their MAC decrease by 6% per decade, so 5 decades times 6% per decade, that's 30% decrease in their MAC. And we're going to see that down way over here. Pregnancy reliably decreases MAC by about a third. 
and then acute intoxication of alcohol, which is just another premedication, and other metabolic disturbances, hypothermia, hypercarbia, hypoxia, sympathetic blockade, probably even things like hyponatremia. All of these will decrease your MAC. We've talked about properties of inhaled agents, and this sort of rounds out the chart. I don't think I test you on any of these numbers. I don't know if the boards do. Certainly you have instructors who will expect you to know the blood gas partition coefficient of all of your agents. And memorizing MAC and vapor pressure are also two things that many people expect you to know by memory. Take a moment to take note of any questions that you may have, and then we'll move on. The first agent we're going to speak about is nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is unique because it's inorganic. It's just an element. It's just dinitrogen oxide. It's actually not volatile. It's just a plain old gas. It smells sweet. It's very insoluble. Nitrous oxide is not flammable. None of our anesthetics are flammable these days. But it does support combustion, like oxygen, which means the triad of fire, the three things you need for fire are a heat source, a fuel source, and an oxidation source. And nitrous oxide can replace oxygen as the oxidation source. The effects of nitrous oxide include cardiovascular depression, although it does stimulate some release of catecholamines. In the respiratory system, we see an increase in respiratory rate and decrease in tidal volume, sort of a panting, and no net change in minute volume, and a significant decrease in hypoxic drive. So hypoxia, the drive to breathe in response to hypoxia is blunted. In the brain, we see an increase in intracranial pressure, and an increase in cerebral blood flow, cerebral blood volume, cerebral metabolic rate, and this is pretty unique amongst the inhalational anesthetics. It's also analgesic, which we don't see by any of our other inhalational agents, or for that matter, many of our IV anesthetic agents. But it isn't complete. You can't totally control someone's pain with nitrous oxide. It does not cause any muscle relaxation of any kind, and it does not trigger malignant hyperthermia. In the renal system, it does decrease urine output slightly due to decreased renal flow. It decreases hepatic flow slightly. Nitrous has been implicated as a cause of post-operative nausea and vomiting, and is eliminated almost 100% by exhalation. There's no metabolic activity. Uh, there's no metabolism of nitrous oxide. We're going to take a few minutes and talk about the toxicity of nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide oxidizes the cobalt atom, which is in vitamin B12. This vitamin is involved in methionine synthetase, and many processes in your body are affected as a result of this. Vitamin B12 is involved in myelin formation, and patients who have peripheral neuropathies or other neurotoxicities may be affected by nitrous oxide. Nitrous will lead to an accumulation of homocysteine. We know that patients with congenital elevated homocysteine levels have heart disease. It's not clear what the effect of homocysteine levels would be in a healthy patient. The inhibition of thymidylate synthetase, which is involved in DNA synthesis, makes nitrous oxide a teratogen, which means it can cause mutations in developing fetuses. Nitrous causes depression of bone marrow production and a megaloblastic anemia. Questions have been asked whether it's safe to use for bone marrow harvest or not, and can exacerbate pernicious anemia as well, which is due to vitamin B12 deficiency. These effects can persist for more than four days after a routine exposure to nitrous oxide, and serial exposures have been shown to be particularly harmful. I included on the Blackboard site a little write-up by Kirk Hogan, who is a researcher on nitrous oxide. And he writes that nitrous oxide inhibition of methionine synthetase is rapid, potent, irreversible, and harmful in a substantial portion of, proportion of patients that may not be identified ahead of exposure. He recommends against the use of nitrous oxide in all patients. 
I'm sure you will run into many, many instructors who use it routinely and love it. And I'm here to provide you just with some of the information supporting each side. There are other issues about nitrous oxide. Uh, there are a lot of costs due to storage, pipelines, connectors. We know the anesthesia machine is more complicated because we have to prevent administration of a hypoxic mixture or a gas line crossover. There's data about exposure of healthcare workers. Even nurses in PACU have been shown to have elevated, to be breathing elevated levels of nitrous oxide above OSHA guidelines. And that's just coming out of patients uh, breathing it into the PACU after they've been brought from the operating room. There have been studies about increased potential risks of miscarriage and dental assistance. And we always worry about potentially gives, giving somebody a low FiO2 by using high concentrations of nitrous oxide. There are some definite contraindications to nitrous that everybody would agree to. We know that nitrous is 35 times more soluble in blood than nitrogen, and so it diffuses out of the blood into a closed airspace faster than air can diffuse out of the closed airspace into blood. So any closed airspace is a danger when nitrous oxide is being used. Patients who have a pneumothorax, and for that matter, any trauma patient who may have a pneumothorax should not be given nitrous oxide because the pneumothorax will expand. The same is true for a venous air embolism, air pockets in the brain, acute GI obstruction, which would lead to an air pocket in the intestines, air in the eye, air in the ear, any blebs or bullae in the lungs, in emphysematous patients, Even normal patients may experience some GI distension, and surgeons will occasionally ask whether the, there's nitrous being used because the bowels are becoming inflated. Even the endotracheal tube cuff can become distended after exposure to nitrous oxide. Patients who have inborn errors of single carbon metabolism and their untested family members should not be given nitrous oxide because of its effect on the single carbon metabolism pathway. The same would be true for patients taking antifolate chemotherapeutics, patients with pernicious anemia, megaloblastic anemia, and even serial anesthetics, nitrous oxide may not be appropriate. We recommend that patients avoid using it for maintenance in pregnant patients, especially in the first trimester. And in extremes of age, it is recommended, although data does not exist to back up this recommendation. And finally, some would have you consider avoiding this in patients with cardiac, vascular, and neurodegenerative disease, but there's absolutely no data to back up this recommendation at this time. But this is recommended by Hogan and his team as well as others. We will stop here for you to note any questions, and we'll pick up with the next installment of this lecture.